Good morning, everyone, and very much welcome to all of you uh, for the session on resilience infrastructure. Um, that's a very nice uh, chance and opportunity to, to present uh, year three projects. Well, uh, practical information, um, when we will have uh, the presentation, there are recorded videos, then a Q&A session. Please use uh, the chat button uh, for raising your question, and I hope that we will have a lively uh, Q&A session at the end of, of this presentation. And uh, with this introduction, um, I'd like now to give the floor to Sergio Escriba from the Commission to set the scene of this session. Sergio, your, your microphone is, is off. Can... Ah, yes, good. OK. Yeah. Thank you, Thierry, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you also for attending this first session of the Road Transport Research 2020 conference about resilient infrastructures. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about resilience in this uh, two, three minutes also a bit about EU policy on that matters, and finally a short introduction to the research projects that are the core part of the session, and you will see the presentations later on. My name is Sergio Escriba, I am project officer uh, working at INEA, the Innovation and Networks Executive Agency of the European Commission. I work for the H2020 Transport Research Unit, and I'm in charge of the portfolio of transport infrastructure research projects. So first thing to, to do for opening this session is to, to, to have a common understanding of resilience. And you know that there are many definitions over the, the scientific community and resilience in general is the system's ability to continue to function at an acceptable level of efficiency in the face of disruptive or unexpected conditions. If we apply this concept to transport, then the system, of course, is the transport system, and the function is obviously to move people and goods. Then transport resilience is the ability of the transport system to move people around in the face of one of these uh, disruptive events. Today, we are going to focus in just one part of the transport system, that is the physical infrastructure. So it could be the road, railways, ports, inland waterways, even airports. But let's go back to the definition of resilience. It says about disruptive events. We can categorize those into two big uh, groups. Extreme weather events due to climate change, for example, extreme temperatures, low or excessive precipitations, strong winds or volcanic eruptions, for example but also man-made events, human-caused events. And in here we are talking about terrorist attacks, but also about strikes, demonstrations, sport events, why not? Cause also a disruption of no normal flow, but also pandemics. In these days, we have seen also some, uh, some problems for mobility, and this is also affecting the transport system as a whole. Infrastructures are designed to last for very, very long time with periods of 50, even 100 years of lifetime. So they will statistically face a numerous uh, disruptive events. Unfortunately, due to climate change, these events are more and more common. What is the level of efficiency? What is the expected service of a transport system in case of disruptive events? Well, at least we need to ensure a minimum level of capacity percentage during and after the event. And uh, the recent literature talk about 50 to 80 percent as the expected uh, value for keeping the transport system operating. This transport system need also to allow emergency vehicles to move across the network without major problems. Transport infrastructure is perceived by the user as something reliable, as perpetual, something that is safe. And the user, the general public, will not understand that a certain road or railway line is closed every year for certain climatic uh, event. So there is indeed a high level of expectations for the transport system, but also it is subjected to changing and sometimes unpredictable environment. So how to, how to merge these two phases, how to face 
the problem of resilience in transport infrastructures, there are several options. We can improve resilience by design, making infrastructure more resilient from the beginning, but this can lead to overspending in the construction phase. This is not always easy to explain to politicians because uh, the in periods of budgetary restriction, right, like now, we are facing. So it's not understood that we overspend in certain infrastructure for the potential event that will happen in 20 or 30 years. But the, the, there are other ways to improve resilience and is by adaptation. So there are ways to strengthen the infrastructure uh, and it requires identification of the weak points that need to be strengthened, monitoring these weak points and at certain moment implementing infrastructure upgrades. But there are also several actions possible beyond the physical infrastructure. Resilience can also be improved through ICT solutions. For example, traffic management systems that are able to activate alternative routes in case of emergency. And also sometimes promoting modal shifts that are not the usual ones. This can be also done, be done from the technology side. Resilience is a priority of the European Commission and has been like this in the last financial framework, but will be the same for the next one. We have seen million euros of investment within the European structural and investment funds, for example, for the adaptation of infrastructure to climate change. But there was also a big effort into the research programs for finding innovative solutions that helped Europe to face uh, resilient um, increase in the infrastructures. We have seen this in Horizon 2020, and we will continue looking at uh, topics dealing with resilient infrastructure in Horizon Europe. The three projects that you are going to know today were selected under a topic in Mobility for Growth called 2016 to 2017, topic 7.1. The call was published from quite a long time ago in October 2015, but what we have learned from that moment is that the challenge and the scope of that topic are far away from being outdated. Climate change is a reality, and the proposed technologies on that topic have demonstrated to be the right one. How was that approach? The topic talked about identification of risk factors, mapping of extreme weather conditions and climate risk hotspots. It also uh, suggested to investigate new materials, construction and maintenance techniques to improve resilience of the physical infrastructure, but also from the ICT point of view, structural health monitoring through terrestrial and remote monitoring techniques, for example, drones, satellite images. There was also a, a requirement to improve links for a smooth model transfer in case of disruptions and of course, the social dimension of the problem, the user perception of risk and reliability of transport systems. These were the common challenges that were addressed by the three projects that you are going to know today. These are Resist, Safeway, and Foresee. The projects have just finished the first period. They are still active. So don't hesitate to contact them if you want to contribute to the research or if you are interested in the results. I also encourage you to participate in the Q&A session. They will, of course, appreciate your feedback. I hope you enjoy the presentations and the rest of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio, for setting uh, very much and very clearly this uh, scene and, uh, well, introducing uh, namely the, the three projects that we will uh, have uh, the presentation through video uh, in a few uh, minutes. So indeed, we have three projects, uh, Resist, uh, Resilient Transport Infrastructure to Extreme Events. We have Safeway, GIS-based infrastructure management system for optimized response to extreme events of terrestrial transport networks. And finally, 4C, future of proofing strategies for resilient transport networks against extreme events. So you will see through this three projects that uh, we are covering quite much of the scene, which was actually uh, said by um, Sergio earlier. So I'd like to welcome now and to ask uh, all the speakers to turn on your camera and uh, your microphone, please, so that um, the audience can, can see you. Um, and we will have now for about 40 minutes um, a Q&A session and a kind of roundtable.
to address uh, a number of questions. Well, I'll start first with um, the first question in the chat box, which is rather um, a general, and uh, each of you could give uh, maybe a, a quick word on that. The question is uh, the following, how resilient is the current infrastructure in Western Europe to sustain the challenges of extreme climatic, climatic conditions posed by the global uh, climate change? So this is a uh, rather um, uh, large uh, question. And so what would be your uh, estimation? Uh, let's start maybe uh, in order. So Kostas, maybe if you want to give uh, your point of view on that. Uh, <clears throat> well, talking for the structures that the uh, resist has been uh, looking at um, um, even if we say that uh, right now they're resilient as the time passes and there is uh, not enough uh, funding and not enough investment that is going to change at least uh, we've seen a few cases in italy and in greece uh, lately of uh, structures uh, being damaged of, from uh, weather phenomena and um, uh, even uh, from accidents uh, so we're trying to cover that and um, as the time passes, it's a, it's a matter of a choice whether you're going to renew this infrastructure or you're going to maintain it. So we're trying to do the best we can about maintaining and offer the best cases, the best solutions there. Thank you, Kostas. And Belen, what would be your, uh, your point of view? Well, I think that um, it's quite uh, complex to... to to quantify how resilient is the infrastructure in, in Europe yet. As well, we are all aware of the, of the need, uh, this is a, um, a hot topic to be addressed. And there is a, an important investment on uh, creating resilient infrastructure. But uh, I think that or what, what we are facing now in, in with the development of our project is that is is not um, a definitive uh, quantifying method to, to 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 know or to to understand how resilient is the infrastructure. Uh, once the the resilience can be quantified and specifically for the transportation sector, then we can start uh, defining those performance indicators that allow us to map and to have a, a clear idea of how resilient is our infrastructure. I, I would basically or I would conclude that we are in the way to, uh, to quantify how resilient is our infrastructure and uh, probably with the investments that uh, the public governments and also the operators and in general of the agents involved in the transportation sector, I think that we are soon uh, uh, addressing and creating uh, a map that allows us to, to understand how resilient we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Belen. Um, well, um, I think we have David uh, Garcia instead of Iñaki. So, David, um, how, how would you also um, um, see the situation? Or Iñaki, I don't know at the end who is going to be the one speaking. You're not here? Well. At least we cannot hear you. So in this case, I, I propose to move on to the uh, second question, which is uh, a more technical one and indeed a very interesting one. Um, you've seen that uh, in the Commission now in Horizon 2020, there was a, there's a large now part on open science, open data and, and so that and, um, and so on. And clearly here the question is, is there uh, already an EU-wide database which would list uh, the resilience of current infrastructure? So are you aware about something like that? Uh, maybe this time starting by, by Belen. Yeah, well, this is actually, I think, connected with the previous question. Huh? Um, and what we have seen so far is that uh, even there is no yet uh, a clear or an EU, uh, EU uh, database on, on about resilience itself, um, what we found it is that um, there is a, a large information uh, of the different components that we will at the end influence on the uh, resilience of, of uh, the infrastructure. Uh, it's, uh, just to mention, for example, um, uh, the database related to um, uh, most recurrent uh, natural hazards, there is uh, quite large databases and maps that can be used as an input for the quantification of, of resilience. 
also uh, in a different um, domain is the infrastructure about oh, sorry the, the the information about uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, cost functionality and so on so i think that the projects like the ones that rises in this in this topic in, in which uh, Safeway, Persist, and Forsy are involved, uh, will allow us to definitely start creating some maps that uh, or databases that could be at the end be useful for uh, the uh, parts uh, participating on, on quantifying and um, using resilience as a, a, a component to, to be taken into account in the decision making. Thank you, Belen. Um, Costas, would you have anything else that you would like to say to complete? No, I will just agree. Oh. I will agree with Belen. It's exactly how it said it. You can find a lot of information, especially in a national level, uh, but I don't think that uh, there is something on a European level, and uh, I, it's something that we should be looking into starting and uh, actually uh, quantifying the resilience. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. There are a couple of other questions which are actually um, interesting in the sense that they are also, um, uh, let's say, going further uh, from what has been in, um, made in the three projects. Uh, namely, they are looking at, um, at the link between uh, remote sensing, in a way, uh, through mostly uh, CAVs, so connected vehicles. So how, in a way, uh, could we probe, or well, let's say, get data and information via probe uh, proper data from the fleet uh, management and so how CAVs in a way uh, can help in that direction and vice versa how uh, resilient infrastructure physical one can help preventing accident so this is a double uh, sense question um, well let's start with Costas we do one one every time well I'm seeing a question here from uh, which is very relative from Gerard Mansur which has says yeah. that uh, on the physical infrastructure to avoid accidents uh, the thing is that uh, right now resist uh, is not looking into smart and connected vehicles we're just mm -hmm. having a mobile application that you can use in order to receive information and in, uh, alternative routes in order to stay clear or get information of what happened on uh, an infrastructure but it's something that we'll be looking for a continuation uh, of actually using like v2x and uh, vehicle to infrastructure infrastructure to vehicle these uh, interconnections between vehicles and and uh, actually uh, roads in order to be able to easier and more accurately uh, notify uh, notify the drivers and uh, I see continuation to that and how that uh, will change the game uh, it would be big if we actually could integrate um, the smart infrastructure of a road with a system that actually give you them give you live information about an event it would be it would be amazing uh, we're looking into it for continuation of resist but it's not something that we are looking in resist right now yeah, thank you very much, Costas. And uh, what about you, Belen? Well, I, I think that um, the, the the answer to this question is is not so direct. I mean, uh, it is true that, for example, Safeway is uh, considering um, uh, the the data recruit from uh, connected um, vehicles in order to have uh, an idea of how are the um, traffic conditions on, on how, or how the, um, the, the people move, okay, in order to uh, detect um, uh, any event, okay. Uh, this is uh, in terms of recruiting information and also um, um, save with is also uh, connecting with uh, end users, with drivers or with passengers by uh, um, recommending um, new routes or alternative routes in case uh, an event is detected, okay? This is basically using floating car data um, from the connected vehicles and then um, Safeway or some partners in Safeway are developing uh, applications based on uh, social media in order to uh, uh, recruit information from uh, end users but also being able to provide the most suitable uh, alternative route or evacuation route in case of uh, an event happens. Uh, avoiding an accident is quite complicated to, to answer. I, I wouldn't say that we are directly avoiding accidents. We are more focused on a, um, a improved mobility, uh, um, provide alternative routes to the uh, drivers, but uh, well, in some cases, this can be also related to preventing an accident, but mm, is not the, the direct um, a, mm, result that we can pro provide with the project. Okay. Yeah, thank you, both of you. 
Um, well, we, we had some questions indeed on the uh, more technical aspect, and um, another set of question is linked to the exploitation and, uh, in a way, how can we facilitate the deployment of your um, innovation? So the the first uh, question in that direction, and um, they will please have a look at them and uh, try to answer to the three of them at the same time. So the first one is. Um, well, saying that a lot of good results uh, from many of your, um, from the projects, um, they are available until now, but um, how is it in the real deployment? Who will take the responsibility in MS um, or what is a business plan? So, well, if you want to, to highlight a bit that, um, well, uh, um, there is another one uh, which says, will your results uh, reach the market? So if you could uh, try to give uh, some um, some thought about that at the end of the project, or will you need uh, more research work? That's important to, to have in mind. And uh, still linked to this exploitation part, um, do you have industrial partners? And if yes, how can, can you please uh, mention how you will, uh, or how this partner will play a role in the implementation process? So, well, let's start now with Belen, if, if, you, if you wish. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, we have to take into account that our projects are research and innovation uh, projects. So it means that there are some parts of the project more focused on basic research or research with uh, lower uh, TRLs and other parts of the project are more closer to the market. Okay, In, in our case, it's especially related to uh, IT uh, services and IT tools. Okay, So as a conclusion, uh, at this moment, or with the evolution of the project, we can say that at this moment, there would be, at the end of the project, some uh, IT tools or services that could be ready to, to be on the market. And actually, there are uh, some results already that are almost, um, I mean, I'm not, um, I cannot be accurate on telling you if they are in the market right now, but uh, as um, these are some applications that have been improved or have considered facilities within our project, uh, this could be quite close to the market. And at the end of the project, for sure, they, they would be. Uh, some other parts of the project, those uh, more related to new methods and, and new technologies, uh, it's difficult to to promise that they would be ready to be deployed after the end of the project. At this moment, we are developing the business plans uh, for some services that are expected to be exploited uh, later. And uh, one uh, special or uh, important aspect of our project is that the IT platform that uh, uh, joins all the components together uh, can be, I mean, the, the purpose is to to deploy and, and to to um, to provide this tool to uh, managers and operators in order they can exploit it. But uh, at this moment, we are still um, discussing how this um, or which could be the strategy to exploit this platform. Regarding um, partners interested in interested in uh, some uh, tools or services, uh, we already had some contacts um, regarding some specific parts of, of the project specifically though related to um, uh, remote sensing and um, uh, some of the platforms that uh, or services that have been already finished in, in Safeway are being um, tested and validated in order to some operators can exploit them, okay? So hopefully at the end of the project, we can also replicate this experience with more parts of the project. What about you, Kostas? How would you uh, complement this question? Well, I feel a bit, <coughs> I feel a bit bad because I'm going to say exactly the same thing that Bella said. Uh, for us, it's exactly the same. We have some things. So we have some parts of the project that are closer to TRL to the market, and there are some that is uh, far away. Like, for example, our vibration module that can be installed by the drone. It's a, it's just a very low TRL design. Um, it's a, it's an extremely good idea, but it's not market ready. On the other hand, the integration platform that we'll be using, it's a, almost a market ready, like the mobility continuity system that we're uh, using, most likely with uh, some testing, policing, and uh, some extra work would be market ready. So it goes exactly, it goes exactly the same as uh, for us. Okay, yeah, thank you, Kostas. Um, well, we have also uh, another question, which is uh, in, in a bit, uh, in a way, to uh, to give some uh, credits and argument 
for uh, supporting uh, more activities on the uh, on resilience and uh, well supporting maybe also the deployment of these technologies and the question is the following is a proper attribution of cost of incident not essential to generate support the uh, to generate support the wide rollout of such technologies for more resilience so well um costas uh, how would you how would you consider that well actually i can't really say that um have an opinion on it uh, the way that we're doing it the, the way that we're doing it right now we're using statistical data and uh, and historical data on uh, how much the cost of an incident is uh, having the um, aggregates of how much it would cost like for an average vehicle and um, the, like the average man hour and uh, etc but uh, i would think that uh, it would go to to the, in case of of uh, the specific application if um if somebody picks it up in for example in germany the cost would be different if somebody picked it up in some other place in the world uh, but i don't really have something too much to say about that mm -hmm. Belen, do you have uh, other things that you'd like to say well i responding directly to the question i think that uh, we cannot say that the cost of incidents are not essential Actually, um, when we talk about resilience, we, we have to uh, uh, take into account that we are talking about many different dimensions, okay? And also it's important to quantify resilience. So how do we quantify the resilience is important. Most directly or most of the approaches are based on actually minimizing cost, uh, okay? Minimizing cost by uh, and not only on the services and the IT services, but also on the consequences, right? So uh, for that reason, I definitely think that the, the cost of the incidents uh, at different levels, uh, uh, environmental, social, economic, and so on, uh, is definitely uh, important. So we cannot, of course, um, avoid this uh, formula for resilience. And just to add something else here, we had a, we had a very thorough discussion with a, a lot of members of the industry, especially the infrastructure managers were very, they were almost vertical across Europe and actually Israel that they do care about the cost. And not only the cost of the system, but the cost of an incident and the cost of maintenance and, the, and actually they wanted quantifiable values of what we offer. So, in uh, especially in the risk management and the risk assessment uh, modules, we do take care, we do take into account costs into different levels. Yeah, thank you for this additional precision because indeed uh, there is a, a need for um, to looking at the balance where what what is better. I mean, and to justify the investment in this technology, it's also good to show that the benefits will enable leveraging in a way that. Uh, or diminishing a lot the incident cost. Um, well, uh, we have a last, uh, and it's another question, the last for the moment, which is um, going to be a, a challenge in a way for you, uh, in the sense that um, your uh, project deal with um, information that comes from the physical infrastructure. And this question is about uh, how, well, let's say, or wirelessly we can be alerted. There is no need uh, that physical infrastructure sends data. Transport should concentrate on synchronization and coordination. Uh, what S and C uh, you think you can provide? So, well, how would you um, react on this, Belen? I could see you, um, and I think it's your you first, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, to be honest, I, I'm not sure I understand correctly the, the question, uh, but in, in any case, I partially agree the, the, the argument, okay? We can, of course, be wirelessly alerted when an event happens, uh, and this is especially relevant for uh, uh, traffic uh, systems and to uh, have an idea of mobility and also to uh, recommend uh, alternative routes for, for the drivers and passengers. Okay, that, that is uh, true, but uh, we cannot um, avoid other type of information. Okay, for example, uh, the structural performance in terms <coughs> of is so relevant here as well. So uh, definitely, I think that we can or we should uh, see everything as a whole and not just uh, avoiding or um, 
concentrating in a single in a single part. Okay, so I I slightly disagree with this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can indeed. I think the question is also here to uh, to challenge you and to get uh, a nice and lively discussion. Costas, uh, would you have the same position as Belen, a different one? Uh, no, it's more or less uh, more or less the same. It's a, pro a provocative idea. Actually, you could actually have if you could have if you could like spread the system in many vehicles, you could have vehicles talking to each other and have sending synchronized information, so we can get a better view of the road. Again, it's not something that would look in the resist and our traffic information are coming straight from the traffic control center of the of the, of the road. But if you wanted to get more immediate and more accurate information, then if you had the vehicles talking straight to your system, it would be extremely, extremely good. Yeah, but that's also another level of uh, protocol discussion and so on. But probably that would be something for next research and next activities. Very, very good. Thank you to both of you for this uh, precise answer. Uh, I do not see, ah yes, uh, now just one more uh, question coming up, which is good. Um, it's about uh, civil works and they are just mentioning that they are costly and slow to implement. Um, I don't know if there is um, really a question behind, but um, well. well. I will oh, agree. Yeah. It's actually the premise on behind all of our uh, SHM uh, uh, structural health monitoring uh, projects. Uh, if there is a damage on a on a structure and it's a serious serious uh, structural damage, it's not only just costly and slow. It's dangerous. Like you can you may have days before. Uh, uh, people can go there and actually look at the building. That's why. That's why we're looking and and that he used the magic word now. That's why we're looking into using drones, and we have other projects that are going to use satellite and try to um, see the area through a satellite and then superimpose any kind of damage on the satellite photos. Uh, trying to keep to make things faster and more accurate and actually keep people at some way is actually what we are trying to do at the best of our abilities. Yep. Thank you, Kostas. Belen, would you like to add something on that? Uh, no, uh, to be honest, now I, I don't have more comments about uh, this, and as Kostas has more or less covered my, my vision as well, so no specific comments on that. Thank you. Well, I may have one uh, one more question um, uh, during the time that maybe some other uh, question can come. Um, well, your projects are really focused on uh, on Europe, which is really uh, good and clear. Um, how, to which extent, do you look also at what's going on in other um, uh, continent and uh, in particular in uh, Asia, maybe Japan, South Korea, where the culture of resilience is um, is really high? Costas, would you would you say a word on that? I would love to, but <laughs> I don't know if it's a word that uh, we would like to hear. The thing is that uh, through our initial research into, into standards and practices, we actually saw that, for example, countries like in Asia, like China, Korea, they have much higher uh, resilience standards compared to Europe. And they're actually well in their way into standardizing procedures in structural health monitoring that will increase resilience. Uh, on the other hand, we have to abide with the rules of the of the infrastructures that we're checking. So we have to try and improve their um, their procedures, but they need to be familiar in order to have a, to have a carry on to the end user. So I'll keep it to that. We are aware that they are more in more involved in the resilience, but we haven't. Um, or we can't, I don't like use the word can't, but uh, take on uh, their research and apply it into the specific uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kostas. How do you, do you share the same point of view, Belen? Well, uh, I agree in mostly with uh, Kostas' um, comment. I would say that also uh, it's an important culture. I mean, uh, not only on the uh, continents that you also mentioned, but also, or mainly in the US. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we are actually uh, working in 
similar directions or at, at least with the same goal. It is true that uh, not all the countries uh, are in the same level of development, but I think that uh, the, as conclusion, that uh, resilience is um, a modern topic or at least something that we are now all realizing, especially probably with the situation this year, with the pandemic, in, in which we can now understand how important is to be ready to support uh, these kind of extreme events independently on the nature. So I think that in general, uh, even it is true that not all the uh, continents are in the same level of, of development. Uh, I think that um, in general, the, the, at the end, we will be um, more or less aligned as the, the purpose to have more in societies. Thank you very much. Well, actually, another comment uh, just popped up on the, on the insurance, and uh, maybe I I'd like to complete this one. Um, well, um, most of the large insurance companies now are, um, well, requested to be more and more involved in risk that they were not covering in the past. Um, well, climate change and the uh, COVID issue, for instance, are uh, on the table of, uh, of the discussion. Some insurance are um, happy to uh, jump on board. Um, some others are much more reluctant. And the insurance of the insurance are uh, not that uh, keen at the moment, at least in Europe, uh, to, to insure the insurance on that. But um, they have some data uh, and they have a lot of data. So how, how would you see maybe uh, some future perspective, at least on the R&D side? Um, how do you see the possibility to integrate uh, insurance data maybe in um, in uh, work that we are doing. Costas, I start with you. Well, that would be yeah. extremely interesting. And uh, actually, uh, early in our project, we identified that the insurance, uh, although it is not, should be involved in the whole life cycle of uh, resilience in the, in, in the infrastructure. Uh, I don't know how readily available insurance agencies would have uh, would uh, provide their data to a research project, but that is something that uh, in a few, in the continuation of our projects, for sure we should uh, uh, discuss and check. Yep. Thank you, Costas. Belen? Yep. Uh, I think just to add to, to Costas' um, opinion, I would say that um, actually uh, the research that we are doing in our projects about resilience is part or could be at the end part of the business of the insurance company, right? So I think that, that uh, uh, the quantification of risk is definitely a key component on uh, optimizing resilience. So I think that in this sense, uh, the, the insur insurance are uh, strictly connected to any uh, developments that are achieved in terms of resilience. Yep, very good. Thank you very much. Well, um, I do not see any further um, comments uh, nor question on the chat uh, box. Uh, we are now 15 minutes um, uh, before the end of the session. So I propose to, um, to wrap up and uh, conclude uh, this session. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank very much uh, all of you three speakers. So once again, uh, Mr. Costas Buklas uh, for the RESIS project. Ms. Uh, Belen Riv Rivero uh, for the Safeway project, and um, Mr. Iñaki uh, Beltran or Mr. David Garcia for the 4C project. Well, I also would like to uh, thank very much uh, again uh, this um, conference this year, uh, AirTrack XVR and European Commission conference. Uh, it's the first time it's an online event, uh, but it's uh, it's really interesting and the choice of this uh, integrated platform uh, is also um, something which is uh, very inspiring for future um, events in the future. So, well, I can uh, again thank, thank everyone very much. And um, I would like to invite you to um, uh, go to the lobby. Uh, it's a way now to, to proceed to end the session. Uh, there is a great uh, online exhibition, so please use the advantage and use the extra time that you have to uh, surf around and maybe have a small break with some coffee and um, have virtual uh, chat in between uh, and before the next session. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, thanks again to the Commission. Thanks to Sergio Escriba and um, see you soon. Bye-bye.